take a seat. This morning as we gather, we join with the angels in praising our glorious God together, the King over all creation. And so let me welcome you to Church by the Bay again. Uh, whether you're joining us for the first time or again for the hundredth time, uh, we're so glad that you've joined us this morning. Uh, my name is Tom and I'll be leading us uh, through our time together uh, before Jerry, our pastor, comes to preach God's worst to us later on. Uh, and if you are a regular with us, then this morning might be a little bit different to our normal Sunday morning. Uh, we'd usually have uh, church for everyone, coffee time, and then teaching time in our age groups. But this morning, as we start the Easter holidays, we're just going to meet together and then we'll have coffee time and that will uh, bring an end to our time this morning. Uh, it's just an opp opportunity for us as a church family uh, to take a break from our regular midweek events uh, and to spend more time uh, together, perhaps meeting up uh, and praying with one another. Uh, that would be a great thing to do over the next week or two. And teaching time will return uh, later on after the Easter break. Now as we uh, continue our time together, let's begin in prayer. Almighty God, our King Eternal, we enter your presence knowing our unworthiness to meet you here. We come before you as sinners, condemned by our consciences and your words. We are weak and heavy laden, needing your rest. Thank you that your day reminds us of your rest from creation and the resurrection of our Saviour, through whom we enter into your rest with you. Encourage us this morning by your grace. Fill us with lively faith and expectancy to meet with you this morning both in your words and through the taste of the future feasts laid out for us by Christ. And may we grow in our love for you and for one another. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, our God is worthy of worship this morning, and one way we can rightly honour him is to join with Christians down through the ages and in all the world, proclaiming that same gospel that we believe. And we're going to do that this morning with the words of the Nicene Creed, it's basically a slightly longer version uh, of the Apostles' Creed that we'd normally say together on Sunday morning. Uh, so please uh, join with me with the words on the screen. We believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Not sure what's happened there, but that isn't the Nicene Creed. That is the Apostles' Creed. But there we go. Um, yeah. But in the Apostles' Creed, we, we heard, for our sake, he was crucified under, under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. And we confess the faith we believe. We cannot escape from our sin, which left us in need of our Saviour to come and die for our sakes. And so it is right that we remember this together. And so we're going to do that as we confess our sin with the words on the screen. So let's uh, confess our sins together. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and deeply regret our very many serious sins of all types that we have committed in thought, word, and deed against you. We know we deserve judgment, but we turn back to you in repentance and are truly sorry. The memory of our sins causes us great distress and we cannot bear the burden. Have mercy on us, most merciful Father, because of our Lord Jesus' death. Please forgive us of what we have done Please help us to serve and obey you with new hearts. And we ask this prayer for your glory and honour, and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
Uh, Now our psalm this morning reminds us of that once for all death of the Lord Jesus that bore the burden for our sin in our place. Jesus himself took on these words on his own lips as he hung on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced the anguish of God's judgment and his rejection on our behalf. And yet as Psalm 22 leads us to see, the Lord did not abandon Jesus forever. Uh, So we're going to stand and we're going to sing Psalm 22 together. So please stand. Dogs have compassed me about and they 
Be seated. Uh, Dan is now going to come and lead us in prayer uh, before Bethany comes to read God's word to us and Jerry comes to preach. Good morning. We're going to be praying for our for the application from last week from 1 Timothy uh, for our Easter evangelism. Uh, for our families at church and for Ryan and Romy at Oak Hill. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you've joined us together as your people to be the church and that our church is our family. Father, you have called us to be the pillar and foundation of truth in this world so that the gospel will be clear to see and you will be glorified. Thank you that in 1 Timothy we've seen how you want your church to be and how we should treat our church family. From last week, Father, please would you help us as your church to honour the right elders. Thank you for their hard work for us and for the church and, and for the job that you've given to them. Please would you help them to do their job well, help them to keep pure and live godly lives and to keep watch over your church. And for those of us who are in the workplace, uh, please would you help us to work hard. Help us to work hard for you and for our bosses. Father, we pray that this, uh, not for our own pride, uh, but so that your church may, may continue uh, to be that pillar and foundation of the truth. Amen. Amen. Father, as we want the gospel to go out to our friends and family and neighbours, we pray for the opportunities we have over Easter to do this. We thank you for the times we've already had to share Jesus with them. And we pray that as people have heard the gospel, and they will do in the next few weeks, we pray that you would save many for your kingdom. Father, would you please bring repentance and faith to those who hear. As we celebrate Easter next weekend with our two services, and may others come and see Jesus and his mission and his love as he died for us and rose again to bring us new life and victory over death. Help us as a church to delight in him all the more as we see him this Easter. And would you bring others into your family? Amen. Amen. Father, as we are joined all together as your family, we thank you that you give us a picture of that in our earthly families. We thank you for all the families that we have in church. And we ask that you'd help them to keep loving Jesus together, to keep serving him and to keep worshipping him. Help both parents and children to do their roles well as they serve you. We thank you so much, Father, that you've adopted us into your family through the cross of Christ. We thank you that you loved us so much to sacrifice your son for us to be your children. And again, we thank you for the wonderful picture of adoption that we have in our church. Please would you help us to have a healthy culture of adoption, uh, to get on board with it, and to love and support those families that do adopt. Thank you, Father, uh, for your love uh, to our church family. May we love our family well so that your church may be built up and you may be glorified. Amen. Amen. Finally, Father, we pray for Ryan and Romy. Thank you for the places that you've put them uh, down at Oak Hill for Ryan and in the hospital where Romy's working. We pray that through Romy's job, you would bring about opportunities for her to share the gospel there. Help her to have her eyes on Jesus as she works, so that she may be ready for the opportunities that will come. And we pray for fruit from them. We pray that Ryan would grow in his love for you as he studies there full time. We pray that what he studies now will be beneficial for his future ministry, and that he would be able to apply what he's learning into what comes next for them. 
We pray for wisdom for that as they look for where to go in the future. As they think about this, help them to trust you at all times. And through this year, may they grow in godliness and glorify you. And Father, we thank you uh, now as we come to your word and hear it preached. We pray uh, that we would listen well, that it would be read well. Uh, we would come and see Jesus this morning uh, and come and hear from you in your word. Father, we pray all these things in Jesus' name, who is our brother and is the head of the church, who is the one who brings us to you, our heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. So the reading this morning is from 1 Timothy, chapter 6, verse 2 to 21, and it's on page 1194. read. Those who have believing masters are not to show less respect for them because they are brothers. Instead, they are to serve them even better because those who benefit from their service are believers and dear to them. These are the things you are to teach and urge on them. If anyone teaches false doctrines, and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, he is conceited and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between men of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all of this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honour and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, and in so doing have wandered from the faith. Grace be with you.
Good morning, all. Nice to see you. Welcome back if you've been away, and uh, welcome to our visitors. Welcome, Mr. and Mrs. Bradley. Nice to see you. Welcome, Hazel. And I think everyone else is normally here. Oh, welcome, Anna, week two. Yep. Good to see you. Welcome back. Now, I want to say a couple of things first. Um, Andrew, could you just see if you can find a photo of yesterday that we can put up? Just help Jack do that for me. Just one photo would do. I want to tell you about last week. It was quite a complicated week at Church by the Bay, so massively appreciate your prayers. Um, we had some schools work happen. Um, we uh, were able to do, in the end, various things meant we were a bit hindered, but um, we were able to do, uh, I'll come to this in a minute, that was yesterday, uh, we were able to do year five, 90 kids in the other hall that we use for C3 kids um, on Wednesday, that was, which is amazing. It was, it was a bit sort of last minute because we uh, kept being changed around and so on. Um, and, and the thrilling thing is that one um, lad and his mum came from that to yesterday's event, which is amazing, isn't it? So praise God. Thanks for your prayers and support. Um, on Thursday, we were able to do a whole school assembly pretty much at Bolton Sands with a, a real-life lamb, which is great, um, and to do the, the lost sheep and talk about Jesus being the good shepherd. So that was a great joy as well. So thanks for your prayers. And yesterday, we had 84 people at our event, of whom 45 were guests. Um, of those 45, 14 were adults and 31 guest children. And there were loads of wonderful things, things like Baby Grow's uh, mums coming and lots of positive conversations about Easter Sunday and in, even Good Friday. Someone said we'd come on Good Friday. And uh, people said they couldn't come Easter Sunday, but we'll come another week. So would you pray that those aren't just words that are said out of politeness on the way out, but actually materialise into coming on Easter Sunday? Matthew's Gospels were also taken, as well as um, the book we gave to every family, The Day the Earth Shook, um, which is a bit of Matthew 27 for kids. So just, you know, thank God with us, really, and thanks for your prayers. Um, and thanks to you if you were able to help. That was really appreciated. Um, I'm going to pray. I think that's everything. Oh, afterwards, yes, we're having, as Tom said, a break from teaching time over the holiday period, which is, is good in some ways. Obviously, it's sad to have not have teaching time, but one good thing is we get to have tea and coffee out on the field, which means kids can run around and have some fun together and a bit longer time together um, enjoying chatting about what we've heard in the sermon and just encouraging one another and getting to know one another. So enjoy coffee time today. And I'm sure there'll be some games that we can sort out or the kids can sort out for themselves as well. Let me pray. Father, thank you so much for being with us this past week. We don't deserve your grace, um, and yet uh, you keep giving it to us. So we thank you and praise you. Thank you for the privilege of being involved through prayer and through helping um, at the school's work we could do and yesterday's breakfast in Jerusalem. Thank you very much uh, for blessing that. And we ask, Father, for the Spirit, your Spirit, to be at work in the hearts of those who heard the, uh, the word, and they might be... Uh, the barriers might be broken down, eyes might be opened. We'd love to see them again and sit under the preaching of your word and so come to Christ and be saved for eternity. We'd love that for the families that we are getting to know. Please, Lord, have mercy. Be with us now as we hear your word uh, preached. Please speak to us by your Holy Spirit and encourage us and challenge us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wonderful. Let's get going. We live in a culture of entitlement. What do I mean by a culture of entitlement? We live in a world where kids are taught, you are very special, you are the best, you can conquer the world, you're a princess, you're a rock star. You're a superhero, you deserve everything. We live in a culture of entitlement. Our culture's heroes get to do what they want right now, don't they? Live a lavish, Instagrammable lifestyle, party living, spend, spend, spend. They're photographed, they're celebrated, and people kind of aspire to that. People think, I deserve this too, I want it now, I don't have to work for it. People are expecting high-paid, high-powered jobs with not, no hard yards. People expect to not have any problems. People expect the good life right now because I'm worth it, I deserve it, and we live in the me, me, me generation, and I should be having the best possible time all the time we live in a culture of entitlement. Does that sound familiar? And people find it very hard to process hard things. Hard things, as you know, are quite normal, and we experience them daily, weekly, monthly, yearly. Hard things, but our culture finds it very difficult to process because we're expecting the best life all the time. Now, what was the sin in the garden right back at the beginning? In one sense, the sin in the garden was the sin of entitlement. 
I deserve this fruit right now. Instead of obeying God and waiting to be given it, it was grasping at the fruit, grasping at the future. I want it now instead of contentment with what God had amazingly given them. All the other trees were beautiful. All the other trees were good for food. Contentment and patience, waiting for God's timing. Not waiting, they didn't wait for God, they took from God. And that's been human nature ever since, hasn't it? And I want to say that culture infects the church too. There's a culture of entitlement inside the church. Christians all too often want an easy, straightforward, rich life even. And there are church leaders who say this kind of thing. You deserve better. God wants you not to have a hard time. God wants to give you every blessing right now. He loves you. You deserve it. You can have everything you want now. Now the trouble is, some of those things are true. God does love you. God does want to give you every blessing. It's a matter of timing. In other words, what we hear from church leaders sometimes today is godliness is a means of great gain. Can you see that in verse 5? Have a look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, 6 even, page 1194 and verse 5. Can you see at the end there, that last phrase of verse 5? So we're chapter 6, verse 5, page 1194. Can you see it there? Godliness is a means to financial gain. You're a Christian. You deserve everything right now. Have the best life you can have all the time because God loves you and wants you to be happy. Men of corrupt mind who've been robbed of the truth and who think godliness is a means to financial gain. Money, money, money. It's always sunny in the rich man's world. But this is so serious, isn't it? We're not, at, well, sorry, we are rather at the end of the letter and it's about two ends. Verse 9. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. That's the bad end. The other is verse 19. In this way, they will lay up treasure as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So you've got ruin and destruction or life that is truly life. Two ends, two options. Ruin, destruction, or true life. So this is very serious, isn't it? We're in this crisis, if you've been with us, in Ephesus, right back in chapter 1 and verse 1. Take a look, please. In the very first line, we're given clues to this crisis in the way that Paul greets Timothy. Remember, the letter to Timothy is also the letter to the church. Grace be with you. Grace be with you all at the last verse of, two, of 1 Timothy. So here, Paul to Timothy, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, verse 1, see it there, chapter 1. By the command of God our Saviour and of Christ Jesus our hope, our Saviour, our hope, give you clues as to what the issues are in Ephesus. The false gospel, the false teachers plaguing Ephesus were offering some kind of law teaching. We don't know exactly what it was, but people needed to do something to save themselves. No, verse 1, God is our Saviour. And from our chapter this morning, the false teachers are promising something now. You're entitled to all the blessings right now. No, Christ is our hope. God is our saviour. Christ is our hope. Verse 1 gives you a clue to the whole issues going on in Ephesus. The false gospel is about what we do and what we can get. The true gospel is what Christ has given us, our salvation, and what Christ will give us, our hope. And that false gospel that's been in the background all the way through has meant a kind of selfish, inward-looking church. But the true gospel of God our Saviour, Christ our hope, is to be offered to the world the grace of Christ's cross and the glory of Christ's return. The grace of Christ's cross and the glory of Christ's return. And that's what Timothy is to in chapter 6 and verse 2. Back over the page, 1194, please. It's a big passage, you're going to find it really helpful to have the Bible open. So page 1194, chapter 6, verse 2. These are the things, Timothy, you are to teach and urge on them. The whole letter. Get the church sorted so the gospel can go to the world. And the church, our church needs, I'm just going to give you the words from our passage, don't worry about seeing them. But, or maybe you can. Sound instruction, verse 3. Teaching, verse 3. The truth, verse 5. The faith, verses 10, 12, and 21. Commands, verses 17 and 18. And the gospel, 
that's been entrusted to Timothy's care in verse 20. What the church needs to get the church sorted so the gospel can go to the world is the truth and the true teaching. And so Ephesus and Morecambe need to hear this warning. Here's our first point. Warning. Men of the world teach a different gospel of false hope. That's our first point, verse 3. If anyone teaches false doctrines and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ, well, these teachers are disagreeing with the Lord Jesus himself. Remember, Paul and Jesus go hand in hand. Jesus chose Paul. Jesus speaks through Paul. And to disagree with Paul is to disagree with Jesus. And the first mark of these men who've gone wrong, we need to hear this warning, is that they've begun to disagree with the authority of the word of God. So watch out for Bible teachers. They'll open the Bible, by the way. They will teach you something even that's true, but they don't teach you the whole thing. And they pick and choose, and they explain away difficult bits, or perhaps never read or teach the difficult bits. They will talk about Jesus, but they won't talk about things like sin and judgment. They will add laws to the gospel, and they will offer life, everything right now, instead of asking, commanding patience. They have plagued the church, and they still do, and they disagree with Jesus, and they disagree with godly teaching. Now, literally, that is the teaching that accords with godliness. So you've got teaching and godliness going hand in hand, like we've seen all the way through the letter. Jesus is teaching and following Jesus, basically. Jesus is teaching and following Jesus. False doctrines and unhealthy teaching uh, goes hand in hand with ungodliness, while sound, healthy teaching goes hand in hand with godly living. We need to hear this warning because these men uh, are teaching some things that are true, and some things that could be true or sound like they could be true. And they're nice. They're nice. They don't have T-shirts warning you, stay away from me, I'm a false teacher. They're nice and they have a nice message that sounds quite nice. Warning. They disagree with Jesus' teaching. They don't follow te- Jesus. And unhealthy teaching, this different gospel, well, it starts in the mind, verse 4. He's conceited and understands nothing. Now, conceited means proud. How proud do you have to be to reject Jesus' own teaching? How proud do you have to be to reject Jesus' command to live a godly life? Quite proud. To refuse to submit to the word of Christ can only mean arrogance and pride. And if you reject Jesus' word, then of course you understand nothing. Verse 5, you have a corrupt mind. They have a corrupt mind, but don't forget, again, Paul's warning them. The Holy, the Holy Spirit's warning them through Paul because these men, they're nice. They have a nice message. This is how God describes them. Paul pulls no punches, but he's an apostle of Christ and God's messenger. This false gospel starts in the mind, comes out of the mouth. He has an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words, a kind of sick craving for uh, disputing and causing problems. And when you reject Jesus' words, all sorts of other words are kind of vomited out which breeds division in the church, verse 4, again, that result in envy and strife and malicious talk and evil suspicions and constant friction. That sounds pretty miserable, doesn't it? Envious competition, bitter division, mutual suspicion, constant friction between men of corrupt mind. Remember, it starts in the mind. They've been robbed of the truth. They've been mugged and the truth has been stolen. The precious truth has been stolen from them. And they're not passing it on to others. So here in Ephesus and in the church down the ages, is actually the battle for the mind, the Christian mind. The need for the leader to be, a Latin phrase we saw a few weeks ago, homo unius libri, which just means a man of one book like John Wesley. A man of one book. Searching the scriptures, studying the scriptures, sitting under the scriptures as our authority, rather than imagining God and what he thinks, uh, man imagining God and what we think God might be like. How many times do you talk to people and they say something like, I like to think of God as, or it starts in the mind, we're just imagining God. We need God to tell us what he's like. He tells us who he is in Christ Jesus and in his word. And our teachers have got to be men searching the scriptures, studying the scriptures, sitting under the scriptures, 
because we default to this man imagining God thing. We need to listen to God. God tells us what he is like rather than I think God might be like. God tells us what he's like. And minds empty of the healthy word of God bring sick words out, out of man, out of the mouth, and breeds division. And it's from this false gospel, this false hope comes. Verse 5, thinking that godliness is a means to financial gain. This is what happens. You imagine your own version of God, then the real authority is actually yourself. If you decide what God's like, you're the authority. And the corrupt mind ends up focusing on me and my stuff. Me and my stuff. If I do these religious things, then the God I'm imagining will give me what I want right now. This is how to have, uh, have money and to have the life I want. If you don't want the true God, you end up stealing his gifts. This is true of Simon Magus, if you've heard of him in Acts chapter 8. Look at him later on. It's true in Ephesus. It's been true through church history. It's true with people who preach what's called a prosperity gospel. Your best life now, the kind of health and wealth thing. You deserve it all, everything now. This culture of entitlement that's infected the church. These things are big in the States, but it's not just the States. They're big in Africa, and they're big in Latin America. They're on your TV, on those God channels, these prosperity preachers. Turn them off, asking uh, for your money for their ministry. It's wicked. It's deceiving people to make money. No, this this is not something that we're immune to. And I just want to say at this point, it's really good that we have an honest and faithful treasurer, Jonathan, who looks after our money and and writes reports and the the charity commission stuff. It's amazing what he does. He gives up his work time a day a week and more. So we should thank God for Jonathan. It's been a while since we've had an item, kids. This is number two. Alert. (laughs) Wake up. It's also true in our own hearts. It's not just other Christians who have this problem. It's true in our own hearts. When we catch ourselves thinking, ever do this? You probably wouldn't say it out loud. I'm a Christian. I deserve. I've worked so hard for the Lord. I should be given that thing another Christian's been given. I, other Christians have whatever it is. Why? How come I don't? I deserve it too. You probably wouldn't say it out loud, but it's in our own hearts lurking. Maybe for some of us, it's not just lurking. Maybe it's sort of seized a bit of a grip on our hearts. There is, it's not just money, is it? It's stuff. We'll come back to this. Verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. There is gain. There is great gain. But it's not from money. It's something better. It comes from being godly and being content. And I want to say this is a rebuke to me and maybe to you this morning. Both godliness and contentment. Satisfaction with what God has given you. Contentment, we don't get it from sort of looking inside ourselves and let's see if, you know, I just want to get peace in my heart and all this kind of nonsense. It's just being thankful for what God has given you. That's contentment. Being thankful for what you have. You and I are probably not, although occasionally I confess I am, hungering and thirsting for a mansion and an estate. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? But I'm not often hungering and thirsting for something as grand as that. I'm just hungering and thirsting for a little bit more. That's what I want. I don't want extravagance. I just want a bit more. So whatever station of life you're in, or stage of life, or whatever you have, you can probably catch your own heart in that, can't you? I just want a bit more, especially, by the way, I want to say, if people at the same stage as you, maybe your siblings or um, someone who's at the same stage of life, has a bit more than you. That can be hard as well. So let's just be honest with each other. This isn't just an Ephesus problem, a prosperity gospel, America, Latin America, uh, Africa problem. It's in our own hearts. The way to true riches... We're talking about future riches, aren't we? Christ has everything. All the treasures are with Christ. If you're in Christ, everything is coming to us. We've just not got to be like Adam and Eve, grasping at it. We've got to wait. And that means contentment, being thankful for what you have. And waiting, being happy and thankful. 4 verse 7, we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. 
can't quite remember what this is called, but do you remember the Egyptians with all the treasures they're buried with? Well, their treasures are either still under the sand or in museums, and they're not there anymore, are they? They didn't take them with them in the end to the afterlife. As Job said, naked I came into this world and naked I shall depart. When she died, how much did old Auntie Nora leave? She left everything. They always do. But if, says Paul, we have food, is that couscous? I don't know if I could be content with that, actually, to be honest. <laughs> Let's put some meat in it or something, yeah. And clothing, if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Be content with food and clothes, yes, even couscous. Something to eat, something to wear. That's the things Jesus told us not to worry about in the Sermon on the Mount. Contentment isn't some kind of look inside myself if I can just get my heart at peace. Forget all that nonsense. Just be thankful to God for what you have. It's a beautiful fruit of the Spirit. It's going to help us, by the way, as church. This pillar that Dan was praying for earlier, from the heart of the letter, chapter 3 and verse 15, the pillar and foundation of truth, and we're going to shine out if we are just content with what we have. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking to you. Is it true of me? It's probably true for you. We always want a bit more. Be content with food and clothes, because our riches are to come. Won't that stand out in our world? that's always wanting more and get, wanting that best life now and sucking every, squeezing every drop dry from the sponge of life because that's all they're going to get, they think. Our riches are to come. People, verse 9, who want to get rich, here are my 50 pound notes from Phoebe. <laughs> People who want to get rich fall into temptation. Now, this is the thing. We're not talking about rich people. We're talking about people who want to be rich. Adults, are you content or are you wanting that little bit more? Kids, what do you want when you grow up? What your, what's your dream? Loads of money? Maybe not. But maybe certain things, sort of a lifestyle that you think, I wish I had that now. When I'm older, I'm going to have that. Things that require loads of money. If you want to get rich with money or stuff, kids, you're going to fall into temptation. Adults too, of course. And a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. That's where this leads. Sounds awful. Because verse 10, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Now note please, not money. Money is a gift from God. The love of money is a root. Not the only root, but a root. And not of all evil, there are other evils out there, uh, but all sorts of kinds of evil, all sorts of selfishness and crimes and wickedness and violence. I may have told you this before, and when we lived in London, when we were at Bible College, they opened a new Tottenham Ikea not far away. 6,000 people turned up for the launch at midnight. Some had queued for 15 hours. When the doors opened, there was a stampede. Thousands, unable to get into the store, trampled over those who'd fallen. In an argument over a sofa reduced to 45 pounds, a man was stabbed. Another 20 people suffered heat exhaustion in the crush. One shopper said, my friend put her hands on a sofa and a man took a mallet from his jacket and threatened to hit her if she didn't let go. Another woman managed to grab a sofa but was then mugged for it by three girls. It just lurks under the surface. do not take much. Money is a gift from God, but money as your God is an absolute disaster. Loving money is a root. All kinds of evil are the fruit. Some people, eager for money, will have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Adam and Eve, remember, eager for what was not given to them. Later on, if you want to look up Achan in Joshua chapter 7, Judas, you may remember, helping himself, the disciples' money bag. Ananias and Sapphira kept money back and lied about it in Acts 5. So you've got Acts 8 for Simon Magus, Joshua 7 for Achan, and Acts Five, Ananias and Sapphira for some afternoon sunshine reading. Where did that go? Adam and Eve, death. Achan, death. Judas' story ends in death. Ananias and Sapphira, death. Look at where false hope takes you. It doesn't even give you what you want in this life because you'll always want just that little bit more. You find that, don't you, with rich people? They're not satisfied either. 
The teacher in Ecclesiastes says, whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Gold is like seawater. You drink of it and it just makes you thirstier. This guy is called Jay Gould, and he's a 19th century American financier. Got a picture of him? Thanks. That's, these are his, apparently his last words. I'm the most miserable devil in the world. He was one of those robber barons of the Gilded Age. He died worth $100 million. This is in the 19th century. $100 million. On his deathbed, his final words. Wow. It's a miserable life and it takes you to hell. This world is lost and the next world is lost. Have you ever seen a Christian start out well in the Christian life and then wander off in the pursuit of money? The weeds of the world growing up around them. Do you feel the strings or the stirrings in your own heart? This is a warning. Men of the world teach a different gospel and it's false hope. But Timothy, you, be a man of God. Here's our second point this morning. Here's the charge. Man of God, guard the true gospel of real hope. Verse 11, but you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. He's got a bolt. He's got to put his running trainers on and run away. Don't dabble with this. Run in the opposite direction as fast as you can, Timothy, from wanting money and stuff and from the proud mind and the vomiting of junk food teaching and the festering division in the church. Don't just stand against it. Flee it. Do a runner. Bolt. These false teachers are wandering away down this path. Flee up the road in the opposite direction. And get hunting. Here we go. You've been wondering why I've been carrying this around today. Get hunting. Pursue these things. Maybe the kind of hunt, you know, like the kind of uh, stag hunting people do where they kind of track a a stag up in the highlands for days, that kind of thing, like pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, keeping going, and gentleness, keep being kind. These things do not come naturally to us, do they? Righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. They're from God. They're his work in us. But Timothy, church leader, Christian, hunt them down, focus on them, follow them, grow in them, get on their tail in hot pursuit of these good things. There's fight, and there, there's flight rather, and there's fight. Here's the third one. It's the battle, bolt, hunt, and war. War. This is probably here, this is fighting the good fight of his own faith because of what Paul says next. He is to fight the good fight of preaching the gospel to the church, but I think here it's Timothy's own battle because of what Paul says next. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Probably that's his baptism. Timothy, you've got to fight for your own safety in the faith. And what does take hold of eternal life mean? Because eternal life is a gift, isn't it? He already has eternal life through God's grace and the death of Christ. But Timothy is to own it, to realize what he has in his hands Enjoy it. He's been given it. Enjoy it. Grab it. Own your salvation. Make the most of it. Timothy, be a man of God. Bolt, hunt, and war. In the sight of God, verse 13, who gives life to everything. So God gives life. God preserves life. And of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession. So in John's Gospel, Pilate says to Jesus, you are a king then. And Jesus answers, You are right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. That's John chapter 18, if you want to add to your afternoon sunshine reading. Jesus is the faithful and true witness, and he confessed, yes, I am the king. He made that confession despite suffering, despite the cross that awaited But he did that with the hope of the resurrection to come. He made his confession. He stood firm. He suffered glory to come. So, Timothy, because God gives and keeps giving you life, church leader, because God gives and keeps giving you life, Christian, because God gives and keeps giving you life, and because Christ was faithful, Timothy, I charge you to keep this command. 
I think this is probably everything Paul said to Timothy as an apostle. Obey Paul until Jesus comes back without blame or spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God is going to bring Jesus back. Jesus is coming back. So why look for riches now when all the riches Christ has, he will share with you and me. Jesus hasn't come back yet. So the charge to Timothy continues. Yes, this is for us today. And we've got to follow the Apostle Paul's teaching in this letter while we wait to see Jesus. God will bring him back. God. The blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honour and might forever. Amen. Burst out in praise of God again. And the different teaching from the false teachers brings discussion and division and distraction, angry words to each other, true healthy gospel preaching brings the praise of God our great God who is unique he's the only ruler there are no other gods he's sovereign he's the king of kings and lord of lords he's immortal he's the only one who has life from within himself in his image he makes us and grants us immortality but God is the only immortal one because he's the only one who gives life to himself he's inaccessible no darkness can approach his glorious light let alone overcome him. He's invisible. The physical cannot contain him. He created everything physical. He cannot be seen. We see his glory in his creation. We see his glory in his son, the Lord Jesus, the perfect image of the invisible God. This God is worthy of all honor and might forever. So the true gospel just brings out praise, uh, our salvation, our hope. And so we give God all the praise, honor, and glory forever. And you can be sure if you're not praising God now and you're not looking forward to praising him forever, then you haven't understood the gospel. Timothy, here's why you should keep going. And again we get how you handle money is the test of whether you have this future uh, and enjoyment of God and the gospel sorted. Does that make sense? So the false teachers, that was shown in how they handled money and how people are handling money. And the true gospel, we're going to think about how we should be handling money. So we did the kind of the not earlier, now this is the what to do with money. It's a test. It shows whether we believe these words about God and the future, doesn't it? It's whether we believe in waiting for things to come, or whether we think we're entitled to all good things now. How you handle money shows whether you love this world or the next, doesn't it? That's fairly straightforward. Verse 17 Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. So there are rich people in the church in Ephesus. Um, There might be some secret rich people here, I don't know. It's okay if you find yourself rich. The passage is not having a go at rich people. The passage is about what you do with your riches. Gold makes a bad God because wealth is so uncertain. We know that right now, don't we? Russian oil, petrol prices, heating prices, cost of living. Don't trust in gold, trust in God. Don't hope in gold, hope in God. Put your hope in God who, verse 17, richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So when we're talking about contentment, I'm not saying you should live an absolutely bare minimal life. It's rather if that's what God has given you right now, you should be content. Gifts from God are good and to be enjoyed now. God is generous to us in this life too. So don't forget to say thank you. Be content with food and clothing. But God often gives us so much more for our enjoyment. Marriage, sex, homes. Food. It might be nice if our homes are like that, but we've got to be content with what you've got. Hopefully your home's a bit bigger, I should say, as well. Homes, food, drink, concerts, opera, plays, pantomimes, books, sketching, painting, swimming, fencing, boxing, walking, playing. Not yet. Too soon. Thank you. Sketching, painting, swimming, fencing, boxing, walking, playing, dancing, writing. God richly gives things for us to enjoy. Gifts make great gifts. Gifts make lousy gods. They're going to let us down. Thank God for the gifts he gives you and enjoy them. God richly gives us good things in this life. It's very rare somebody only has food and clothing. If you do only have food and clothing, be content. God gives you gifts. He'll never let you down. And we have the hope 
of life to come. Much better riches. So money is not evil. If you have money, it's how you use it that counts. Verse 18. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. Now, for that picture, please, Jack. I can't help but think of our sabbatical time in Oxford, where we got uh, 11, 12 weeks, uh, fr- a free house, and then access, access to the swimming pool. I mean, it's just extraordinary. Rich people, obviously, being rich in good deeds and generous and willing to share. It's what you do with your money that counts. If you've got money, it means you'll have more time to serve, And it means you'll have more money to be generous with. And there's lots of ways you can do that as Christians. How you handle money shows whether you love this world or the next. As Jesus said, as Paul quoted the Ephesian leaders back on the beach in Acts chapter 20, add that to the list this afternoon, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So the false teachers think it's more blessed to receive than to give. No, it's more blessed to to give than to receive. That's the gospel, isn't it? God giving. Jesus giving, Christians giving. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So let's sum this up. Enjoy giving richly like God gives richly to us. Here we go. Three points to sum up what we said about money. Whatever you've got, be thankful. If you've not got much, be content. If you've got a lot, be generous. Whatever you've got, be thankful. Keep them up a bit, Jacks, please. Um, whatever you've got, be thankful. If you've not got much, be content. If you've got a lot, be generous. A major way we thought about already in this letter is to give to church, to help those churches caring for, and to pay the pastor, actually. It's actually a biblical thing to do from chapter 5. Verse 19. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that's truly life. Put your hope in God for this life and the next treasure in the coming age and the life that is truly life how you handle money shows whether you love this world or the next whether gold is your god or god is your god might be worth just having a think while you're sitting there reading those bible passages this afternoon in the sunshine your bank statement is quite a private document isn't it you wouldn't like other people to see it i doubt anyone else does unless you have someone helping you with your finances Probably just you, and if you're married, your spouse sees your bank accounts. What does your bank statement say about your priorities? A Christian once told me that their aim was for their giving to church to be their biggest expenditure. Let me say that again. Their aim was for their giving to church to be their biggest expenditure. Not that that's always possible. It's an aim. Obviously, housing costs as they are, but an aim to give uh, of the, all the percentages, you have to work out what you're spending on your house and your bills and your food and you're looking after your kids and all the rest of it. The aim. I thought that was quite helpful and challenging. What's your aim for your giving for church? It might not be possible. I understand that. Because of uh, the costs of what they are and it depends on what your money situation is. That's completely between you and the Lord. But an interesting aim. And so as we come to a close, for the whole letter, let's draw things to a close briefly. Timothy, guard the gospel, verse 20. Guard what's been entrusted to your care. Turn away from godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed and in so doing have wandered from the faith. They've wandered, another word, wandered. Timothy, run away down a different road and pursue and hunt those good things. These have wandered from the faith. Grace be with you all. Remember, it's a letter for the church to hear. That's plural in the Greek. It's only God's grace, isn't it, that's going to keep us. Pray for our church to receive the grace of God. And Timothy, guard the gospel. How does he guard it? By preaching it. Here, on this picture, are some fragments of a copy of Matthew's gospel. They're possibly the earliest known fragments of the New Testament, or even of a book They might date, it's hard to be sure, from the first century. I got to see them in 2001. In hushed tones, the president of Magdalen College, Oxford, took us through to the special part of the library. He opened up a special drawer, and there, under protective glass, were these fragments, under lock and key, these fragments of possibly the first uh, copy that we have, or uh, fragments of a copy of the Gospel. 
this is not the guarding of the gospel that Paul is talking about. I mean, it's nice to see them, but that's not the guarding of the gospel. Guarding the gospel is to protect it from false teachers. How do you do that? How do you protect the church with the true gospel? You preach it and teach it so that the church stays in the faith and the gospel can go to the world. Guard the gospel by holding on to it and teaching it. And so get the church sorted and so the gospel can go to the world. Preach the grace of Christ's cross and preach the glory of Christ's return. May God help us to do this at Church by the Bay. Let's pray. Father, we need your grace. We can't do this on our own. It's a massive task you've given us. Lord, please help us to um, enjoy the grace you've, you've given and to teach it to one another. Help the church leaders to teach this grace, to teach that you are our saviour and Christ is our hope and to look forward. And that money test that we've seen today, Lord, we know the stirrings and the pull of our own hearts and our lack of contentment with what, what we have. May we be a thankful people, may we be a content people, and may we be generous with what we have. Help us, Lord. We need the work of your Spirit in our own hearts. Help us to stand against um, those false teachers out there and to protect ourselves and our own church. And help us to stand out like a pillar and foundation of truth as a thankful people, a content people, and a generous people. And may we stand firm and stay safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing. Would you stand? What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our hope?
Christ the hope in my plan. Please take your seats. And welcome to the communion meal at Church by the Bay. You can find some notes uh, on how we do communion uh, at the front if you haven't uh, had communion with us before. We've been fed with the word of God. Now let us feed on the body and blood of Jesus as the Holy Spirit strengthens our faith as we share this visible word together. Paul writes, Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. As we share the bread and wine, we get to share in the body of Christ and share in the blood of Christ. There's no change in the bread and wine. They stay the same. But through this meal, we are fed, spiritually speaking, with the body and blood of Christ. The bread and wine doesn't change, but God uses the bread and wine to change us. This meal is for all who have turned to Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins and are seeking to follow him. The question for you this morning is, do you turn from your sins and turn to Jesus for forgiveness? And let me be clear, if you're not repentant of your sins, if you're not following Jesus Christ, then this meal is not for you. Please do not take the bread and wine out of embarrassment. It is better that you don't share it. But let me also be clear, if you are trusting in Christ, then whether you are feeling joyful or terrible, however you come this morning, this meal really is for you. It really is. And so, church by the bay, hear the comfortable words our Saviour Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Hear these words from the apostles Paul and John. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. So let's pray together. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, thank you for this new covenant meal. You have given us your promise that you are our God and we are your people. As we eat this bread and drink this wine, please feed us by your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the cross of our Lord Jesus, who was pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Our punishment fell on him, so we might be given forgiveness for our sins. As we eat together, we thank you for making us a people of your very own. Thank you for your church, our brothers and sisters, and thank you for this taste of the future feast as we look forward to eating with our King when he comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul writes in his first letter to the Corinthians, I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is a church meal of joy. So as we share together, why not look around at your brothers and sisters and smile. Uh, the servers will come around now and we'll wait uh, until we've all been served before we eat and drink together.
And if you'd like to take your bread, brothers and sisters, this is Jesus' body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of him. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in his blood. And here's a prayer of thanks. Thank you, Father, for sending your Son as a ransom for many. Thank you that on the cross he took your wrath at our sins. Thank you that we don't have to face your righteous judgment, but instead can receive your royal welcome as your children. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit as we wait for the Lord Jesus to return. We praise you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Church, by the way, let's say these words of Paul together. If God is for us, who is against us? He did not even spare his own son, but offered him up for us all. How will he not also with him grant us everything? Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer is no, everyone. nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Church, by the way, Jesus says to you, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I give you a new command, love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The Apostle Paul says, Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price, so glorify God with your body. We've just celebrated the death of the Lord Jesus together and that work that he has done for us. Um, uh, uh, this work of growing the kingdom uh, is one that God uh, himself has done for us in the Lord Jesus. He is the one with the power, power and authority to do so and he has given us everything. So as we began our time at the start uh, this morning, at the start of 1 Timothy, Let's end by praying these words together on the screen. Should be some words, Jack. After the song. Brilliant. Let's pray these together. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honour and might forever. Amen. Uh, well, as we uh, finish, um, it is someone's birthday this week. It is Izzy's birthday. Is that right? So, Matt, can you, yeah, thanks. <laughs> Let's uh, sing together. Words on the screen. Happy birthday, Izzy. Let's sing. Happy birthday to you. To Jesus be true. May God's many blessings be always with you. Wonderful. Happy birthday, Izzy. Uh, one final reminder is there are uh, Good Friday and Easter Sunday invites on this table. Uh, it'd be great if you took one and perhaps uh, gave them to your neighbours or those you might come across uh, the next week. Uh, invite them to come and celebrate that hope that we have in the Lord Jesus uh, this Easter. Uh, in a moment, we're just going to head out for coffee time outside, uh, as Jerry said uh, earlier. Um, but I need four volunteers, hopefully some strong men, to come and help move a gazebo. Could I have four volunteers now? would be great. Mike, Mark, 